Casper Creek is located in the Jackson Demonstration State Forest, about five miles southeast of the town of Fort Bragg on California's northern coast. For about a quarter of a century, this basin has been the focus of research by the U.S. Forest Service in partnership with the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection. Their aim? To discover some of the effects timber harvesting has on a forested watershed in Northern California. In question is whether modern logging operations have any negative effects on the integrity of the watershed. Does erosion steal valuable topsoil, threatening the growth of new generations of redwoods? Are streams in the area able to handle the increased sediment loads that are washed into them during winter storms? Is flooding likely to be more severe or frequent after logging? And how will the fish fare? Will there be enough suitable habitat after the loggers have left? Will the quality of the stream bed be good enough for spawning? Will enough young fish survive to return to the ocean? Here on Jackson State Forest, the cooperators have already found answers to some of these compelling questions. Answers that they hope will point the way to better forestry practices throughout the state. The first phase of the Casper Creek study, which began in 1962 and concluded 14 years later in 1976, has produced a wealth of information that is still being analyzed. At the Forest Service Redwood Sciences Laboratory in Arcata, principal hydrologist, Dr. Raymond Rice. We started with a typical watershed experiment, what we call a paired watershed experiment, where we study two basins that are roughly comparable. Uh, we log one and leave the other one alone to serve as a control. But before logging, we monitor both of them for several years. Then when we begin logging in one watershed or road building, we can see how it is performing relative to the other watershed. Stream gauging stations were installed on the north and south forks of Casper Creek. Instruments at weir ponds like this one measure sediment load and stream flow. The study has been a productive division of labors. The California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection provided the field laboratory. They constructed the facilities, collected the data, and oversaw the logging of the experimental watersheds. The Forest Service scientists at the Pacific Southwest Experiment Station designed the experiments and analyzed the data. I believe that one of the unique aspects of the Casper Creek study is the 26 years of continuing cooperation between CDF and PSW. The study started in 1962, and after a five-year calibration period, a road system was built into the South Fork drainage. The effects of this road system were measured in local on-site erosion, suspended sediment load in the stream, and sediment deposits in the debris basins. Logging commenced in the South Fork in 1971 and was completed in 1973. During this time, the untouched North Fork served as a control. Since the, this phase of the study, the force practice rules have changed, and during the North Fork phase of the study, we will be looking at harvesting under the current rules. At the time of this first phase of the Casper Creek study, it was common logging practice to selectively cut the timber, skidding logs downhill with tractors to roads near the stream. Compared to the unlogged North Fork, Dr. Rice and his co-workers found that the sediment in streams increased 80% with road building and nearly 300% with logging. These sediment rates dropped off quickly after the logging was completed. From the standpoint of erosion, there's certainly going to be some price to be paid when one enters natural landscapes to take trees. The price may be reflected in terms of fisheries, water quality, or site degradation. It's just that that price should be appropriate when weighed against commercial benefits. Like other studies, this one at Casper Creek found that most of the sediment was carried only during short periods of very high flow. 
In fact, most of the suspended sediment was carried by flows exceeding 45 cubic feet per second. Discharges of this size or greater occur only about 1% of the time during strong winter storms. To further study the relationship between sediment and flow, Dr. Rice devised an index of the stream's ability to transport sediment. He calls it SQ25, and it indicates the stream's power in terms of the rate of water flow in the top quarter of the total stream flow. Most small steep watersheds are supply dependent. That means that the fast flowing water has enough energy to carry much more sediment than is available for transport. Logging and the associated disturbances loosen up the ground and make more sediment available for transport. This was confirmed by a plot of the relationship between sediment and stream power for the South Fork of Casper Creek during the years before logging started. It showed a slow to rise curve. But when sediment enters the stream because of disturbance of the ground by road building or logging, sediment discharge increases rapidly with stream power. Although sediment discharge was supply dependent during the undisturbed years, it switched and became more stream power dependent during disturbance years. Road building and logging freed up more sediment for transport. Consequently, the discharge of sediment depends more on the ability of the stream to carry sediment. The result is that more sediment is transported by the heavy flows of major winter storms. Another possible consequence of logging is that it can destabilize the stream channel itself. The construction of roads and skid trails, even on a moderate scale, could increase peak storm flow. They could compact surfaces, which could reduce water infiltration, or they could intercept subsurface water and channel it directly into the stream through drainage ditches and the like. But when scientists analyze the Casper Creek data, they found no change in any of several aspects of storm flow during and after road building. They also found that neither selective timber cutting nor tractor yarding produced any major hydrologic consequences on the South Fork watershed. This occurred in spite of the fact that by the end of logging, about 15% of the watershed had been compacted by roads, landings, and skid trails. At the Redwood Sciences Laboratory, lead hydrologist, Dr. Robert Zeber. We found that stream flow peaks increased about fourfold in the South Fork following logging. However, these peaks were small peaks which occurred in the early fall. Later in the season, during the large storms, there was very little change in storm flow volume or in storm flow peak in comparison to the control watershed. The Casper Creek study suggests that not only was logging relatively innocuous with regard to increasing stream flow, but that the construction of landings and skid trails was also insignificant in terms of its storm flow response. We believe this because the only peaks that we observed to be increased following logging was the early fall peaks. If landings and skid trails had been hydraulically important, we would have seen increases in peak thro flow throughout the year not just in the early fall season. The reason for the increase in fall runoff is that forested watersheds are initially drier than log watersheds. Trees use more water than no trees. This means forested areas have a greater capacity to absorb moisture. But as soon as soil in the unlogged areas becomes as wet as that in the logged area, the two perform identically throughout the rest of the year. Although logging did not markedly affect the volume of runoff or peak flows, it did alter its timing. The hydrographs, which are plots of runoff with time, were moved forward about an hour and a half. This indicates that logging had accelerated the runoff of rainwater, presumably because it created skid trails and other packed surfaces that water couldn't penetrate. But overall, uh, logging did not seem to have a negative effect since only the timing was changed. Now it is entirely possible that someplace downstream an adverse effect might be occurring, say where the flow from the logged watershed joined flow from an unlogged watershed. 
Suppose that before logging, flows were unsynchronized. By that I mean the flow from one of the watersheds arrived before the flow from the other one. Logging by accelerating runoff might then bring the flows in synchronization. So if they arrived at that point at the same time, this could raise flood peaks, accumulate volume, and possibly have downstream degradation. The opposite effect is also entirely possible. Formerly synchronized flows could become unsynchronized, uh, lowering downstream flood peaks. It's just such complicated interactions between separate parts of a watershed that prompted the second phase of the Casper Creek study. For phase two of the study, involving the North Fork, the roles of the two watersheds have been switched. The now stabilized South Fork will be used as a control while in the North Fork, separate catchments will be clear cut, clear cut and burned or left unlogged. As in the first phase of the study, about 60% of the timber volume will be removed. But a major difference will be the predominant use of skyline yarding and roads located high on the hill slopes to harvest the trees. This change should greatly decrease ground disturbance and soil compaction compared with that in the South Fork, which was logged entirely by tractors. It will compare logging conducted under the current forest practice regulations with logging conducted under rules in use before California's Zeberg Negedly Forest Practice Act was passed. As in the first study, the cooperators will monitor the discharge of sediment and the patterns of stream flow before, during, and after road building and logging. But both the study methods and equipment have been improved since the first study especially with the development by the Forest Service of a new, more accurate sediment sampling technique. Past analyses of suspended stream sediment have underestimated actual values by as much as 50%. But we expect that this new sampling technique will yield accuracies of over 95%. We have installed 13 new gauging stations like this one. Each station has a microcomputer which controls a pumping sediment sampler, which takes suspended sediment samples. In spite of this automation, we have field crews out here 24 hours a day during storm periods to take manual samples, which are needed to calibrate the automatic equipment measurements. The crews also replace the filled sediment sample bottles and offload electronic records. The significant portion of the study, however, is the design itself. We are now evaluating the cumulative effects of logging. A cumulative effect occurs if one acceptable activity interacts with another acceptable activity to produce something that is unacceptable. For example, a fish habitat can be harmed if logging raises water temperatures too high. Uh, suppose that a part of a main channel is dependent on the tributaries cooler water to maintain uh, satisfactory water temperatures. Suppose further that uh, we log those tributaries and raise their temperatures by uh, opening the stream channels to more sunlight. As a result of this, the water temperature in the main channel might become too high, even though the water in the two tributaries was still within acceptable limits. It's conceivable that other cumulative effects may occur in a basin following logging. We already mentioned the possibility of increased flooding, which might happen if the timing of runoff were shifted so that peak flows from separate watersheds combine at a point downstream. Flooding could also occur if logging substantially increases storm runoff. It's more likely that small, steep watersheds that were logged might transport sediment to another stream with less power. There, the sediment settles out, perhaps harming the quality of habitat for fish. To check for these and other cumulative effects, 
scientists will measure sediment and flow in catchments of the North Fork. They'll compare those areas where no activity is taking place, where a portion is being clear-cut, and where parts are clear-cut and burned. We figure that a cumulative effect will have been demonstrated if the sediment delivery or flow from one basin interacts with the sediment delivery or flow from another basin and is picked up downstream as a joint effect which is greater than would have been expected from an analysis of a similar smaller watershed. Another aspect of watershed hydrology being studied during the North Fork phase is the drainage of hill slopes to subsurface soil pipes. Existing theory on hill slope drainage and erosion is inadequate when subsurface soil pipes are present. Soil pipes can lead to accelerated subsurface erosion, gullying, landslides, and other slope failures. Studies of soil piping and subsurface hydrology are important to help engineers and forest hydrologists understand subsurface drainage and hill slope hydrology which can be used to reduce landslide erosion and gullying. Scientists also studied another aspect of watershed hydrology during the North Fork phase. This was the underground drainage through soil pipes. Flow from subsurface soil pipes is being diverted into calibrated standpipes at three sites in the North Fork watershed. Dr. Ziemer's studies of the drainage from hillsides down to the soil pipes should help forest engineers better understand slope stability and water movement through the soil. Here at the K2 site, in addition to studying soil piping at the base of the swale, we are studying subsurface drainage on this hill slope. Instruments such as this tensiometer will be installed at five meter increments up the slope to monitor poor water pressures during storm events. We'll explore whether subsurface drainage patterns change after roading and logging in the swale. But hydrology and sedimentation aren't the only aspects of stream ecology that will be studied by cooperating researchers. Fishery biologist Lynn Decker. The potential impact of logging on salmon and steelhead and streams is an important issue and always has been. The difficulty is in linking the direct and indirect effects due to watershed in the production of fishes in streams. Um, for instance, how do you account for fishing pressure in the ocean or a bad year at sea? To answer this question, Decker introduced fish in equal numbers into monitored reaches of both the North and South Forks of Casper Creek. She will watch how they respond to any changes in the habitat during and after logging. In Casper Creek, we're assuming that the fish will either stay or leave, dependent on the quality of the habitat. Decker will correlate fish growth and survival with any changes in sedimentation, hydrology, or habitat. Her data will then be compared to the results from the unlogged South Fork. One way logging could reduce habitat is by introducing too much sediment into a stream. Pools could fill, and this would reduce living space for the fish. Sediment might also alter the quality of the stream bottom, reducing its attractiveness to spawning fish. When the second phase of the Casper Creek study ends in the late 1990s, there will be a sizable body of knowledge on the effects that modern logging practices have on watershed performance and fish survival. Forest Service scientists expect that the Casper Creek study will give forest managers public policymakers and the timber industry, an empirical basis on which to formulate sound logging policies and procedures. Policies and procedures that will minimize major negative effects on the environment and help managers maintain our Northern California timber resource and fish populations for years to come.